Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Katie Naples Mitchell. I'm the program director of the program of criminal justice policy and management here at the Kennedy School in the Malcolm Weiner Center. Um, we are uh, here today for our last event in our spring semester speaker series on surveillance, criminalization, and punishment. Thanks to the wonderful and dedicated work of my colleague Brian Welch, who manages all the behind the scenes logistics. Many of those videos from earlier in the series have been posted already on our website and YouTube link. So if you missed one of those events and this piques your interest, by all means, please go back uh, and watch them. They are publicly available. Um, and we thank all the people who have made that series such a success, including some names who have participated earlier in the semester who I see are joining us again today. So thanks to those who are returning. Um, today's event is sort of a shift a little bit from what we've been focusing on. I think we've spent a lot of the semester cataloging some of the harms of uh, of law enforcement surveillance and the increasing surveillance state. And today we're gonna talk about how communities are responding to that surveillance state and, and seizing control. And I'm delighted to have our three guests who are working in different contexts in different parts of the country, but doing really related work, I think, and very complementary work um, that's rooted in community responses to surveillance and criminalization. So without further ado, I'm gonna give brief bios for, for each of them uh, and then um, I'm going to uh, pivot to our moderated panel where we're going to hear from, from them and, and get to relish their expertise. So again, thank you to, to Trina and Conti and Shakir for being here. So first of all, Trina Reynolds Tyler is the data director at the Invisible Institute, a journalist and a native of the South Side of Chicago. She leads Beneath the Surface, a project employing machine learning to identify gender-based violence at the hands of the Chicago police. She also, as of Monday, won the 2024 Pulitzer Prize for Local Reporting with Sarah Conway for their investigation, Missing in Chicago, which we're going to talk about in depth today. Yeah, huge congratulations to, to Trina and her team. Um, Trina works to document how communities unable to depend on the police are forced to create safety and accountability outside of the carceral state. And as a data scientist, she centers the practice of narrative justice in her inquiries. She is an abolitionist and trained restorative justice practice, uh, practitioner, an organizer with Not Me, We, and serves on the University of Chicago Council attempting to measure the institution's impact on local residents of the South Side. You can read more about her on our website, on the Invisible Institute website, and now on the Pulitzer Prize website. Um, <laughs> Uh, Shakir is an attorney working with the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition and Los Angeles Community Action Network. Shakir previously worked as a senior staff attorney at the Bail Project and as an impact litigation attorney at the Bronx Defenders, where he was a Skadden Fellow. Before that, he was a law clerk to Justice Mariano Florentino Cuellar on the Supreme Court of California and to Judge Beverly Martin on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. Shakir is licensed to practice law in California and New York, and he received his JD up here in Cambridge from Harvard Law School, um, where he was also an editor of the Harvard Law Review and his BA in South Asian History from Columbia. He's also a part-time lecturer at uh, UCLA. Cynthia Conti Cook is Director of Research and Policy at the Surveillance Resistance Lab, where she co-authored recently a report in March, My City, Inc., A Case Against CompStat Urbanism. Um, prior to that, she was a technology fellow at the Ford Foundation's Gender, Racial, and Ethnic Justice Team, where she helps build grantees' capacity to respond to the expanding use of surveillance technologies against immigrant communities, as well as the potential use of technology to criminalize people who seek or aid people in seeking abortion. Um, she is also the author of Open Data Policing and co-author of Extradition in Post-Row America. And the article Surveilling the Digital Abortion Diary was featured on many major news outlets, which you can also read. Um, <clears throat> prior to that, and the way that we first connected was uh, in Conti's work at the Legal Aid Society, developing a police misconduct database called CAPSTAT that has now been, I think, rebranded as Law Enforcement Lookup, um, which pulled from public records to en enable communities to understand police misconduct records uh, among the NYPD. Um, and we're so delighted to have all three of you here today, um, each of you doing kind of different work, uh, but again, very related. So I figured we could start with some kind of foundation laying as we often do and a framing about positionality for each of you. So I, would, I was hoping you could each talk a little bit about what led you to the work that you do, the formations or organizations you're now part of, what kinds of projects they take on and what role you play particularly within those broader coalitions. I know I, we were planning to start with Trina, but I don't know if your voice is, is up to it. If you want to lead us off, you're good. Okay, so Trina, can you jump off and then we'll go to Conti and then Shakir. Awesome. Well, so one, thank you so much for having me today. It's really, I'm so glad to hear, be here speaking 
with these other speakers, fans of your work, period. Um, I'm from Chicago, I'm a Southside native. And again, I apologize for my, my voice right now. It's been a really long, long week. Um, I began at the Invisible Institute as an AmeriCorps member. I was, the year before, I had been doing some circle keeper work with young folks at like this violence prevention organization. At the same time, I was the comms co-chair for BYP 100. And um, there was a Say Her Name campaign, Dante Servin, the guy who uh, murdered Ricky Yaboy, he, he resigned the day before his firing hearing. And so I began, became really interested in the systems of accountability. And I just so happened to be, you know, um, looking for a second year fellowship at the same time that the Invisible Institute uh, had space and room for me and a colleague of mine. So, you know, just to talk a little bit about the Invisible Institute, we're a nonprofit journalism production company that's based on the south side of Chicago. And we primarily work to enhance the capacity of citizens to hold public institutions accountable. That means like making information accessible to the public. Um, much of that work is done through investigative reporting, multimedia storytelling, human rights documentation, and the curation of uh, and orchestrating public discussions, public conversations, um, creating spaces for people to have meaningful dialogue um, and tease out right uh, the, the landscape of society um, and the systems that work within it as data director at invisible institute you know i coordinate on investigative reporting projects that we're doing you know we have the citizens police data project which houses police misconduct records going back to 1988 but then of course i lead beneath the surface which really is a a bond between narrative justice and data science, where we use machine learning to parse through narrative text of police misconduct records between 2011 and 2015. And of course, we just came out with the piece um, in November of last year, Missing in Chicago, which I'm really excited to talk to you all about today. Phenomenal. Thank you so much for that overview. Go ahead, Conti. I want to echo the thank you for the invitation, and I'm also just excited to be on a panel with both Trina, you, and and Shakir. I feel like um, we've passed our, our cross of paths have crossed several um, times, and I haven't quite gotten to be in conversation with you both like this before. And I'm just excited. It finally, is happening. Um, currently, I'm at the Surveillance Resistance Lab. And the Surveillance Resistance Lab is working at the intersections of many different issues and technology. We're trying to look for the digital public infrastructures that are going to be expanding the carceral capacity of the state and the corporate control over um, public goods going forward. So for example, we're looking at cell site towers that were put in place 20, 30 years ago and back then it was all about expanding communications. It was all about expanding convenience and facilitating our ability to all be in touch with each other. Does that sound familiar? But then now we're realizing that those cell site towers are also facilitating electronic monitoring, stingrays, and many other types of surveillance technology. So what we're doing is we're trying to understand what type of digital public infrastructures are being built today that are going to facilitate the expansion of surveillance tomorrow. We are doing that specifically by looking at sort of like a triple threat of technology um, that we see coming and not getting the kind of attention from, um, from folks that are looking at surveillance quite as much as other types of technology. So for example, digital driver's licenses, digital wallets, and the centralized city databases. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about the report that we just released on one of those centralized city databases in New York. I'll leave it there. Perfect. Go ahead, Shakir. Thanks, and hi everyone. And yeah, it's also it's it's really exciting and an honor to be here with both of you. I I especially some of the work I want to talk about less about surveillance, more about sort of counter surveillance and cop watch is is work that cons is very inspired by both Invisible Institute and and um, the work Conti that you've done with NYPD records. And I and I also haven't. I've just been kind of 
like just swept up in all this chaos around it. I haven't had time to really sit and talk to others nationally about how that work fits into similar efforts. So I'm excited. That's getting ahead. Um, to, so just introduce, yeah, so I'm working with this group, Stop by the Peace Buying Coalition, I'm wearing our merch, which uh, we sell to uh, fund our operations. Um, and uh, Stop by the Peace Buying was founded about 12 years ago, mainly um, like a lot of organizations kind of as a campaign against a particular um, surveillance program that especially looking back on it today is not like it's it's sort of you it at least superficially doesn't seem that related to kind of technology and data and the way that our work has come to focus on. And I think that's important to kind of recognize the lineage of of even when we talk about digital surveillance and we talk about kind of mass data and data driven policing, some of the um, building blocks of that are obviously technologies and and um, you know the development of fusion centers, the development of uh, kind of algorithmic technologies. But it's just as much kind of this introduction of a form of policing that, uh, at least in our analysis, software response analysis, kind of originates with the development of the national security state um, and also efforts more than anything to reform those uh, the harms and excesses of that rather than um, uh, bringing an abolitionist approach to it and, and, and really trying to shift resources and power away from the state efforts to kind of standardize how, uh, how communities are being surveilled, efforts to um, uh, um, kind of create criteria and, and to kind of create guardrails around that. That's what we saw in the national security policing that that um, it was this program called Suspicious Activity Reporting, SAR, um, that, that Stop the Spying was formed as a reaction to and as a campaign against. And then over the years, our work has kind of has, has involved really taking on uh, predictive policing in LA, um, kind of other aspects of the architecture of surveillance by LAPD, and kind of just, you know, all forms of surveillance and social control that extend beyond the police, you know, extend to child welfare agencies, extend to immigration enforcement, exchange, and extend to um, uh, provision of, of housing services and all of that. And I think a really key kind of unique aspect of our work is we're based um, in the Skid Row community of, of uh, Los Angeles. And, you know, our, our organizing community is primarily unhoused and extremely low income residents not typically the, the people who are kind of at the front lines of thinking about surveillance technology. And so I think our work, especially some of the kind of community-based research and, and other organizing stuff we'll talk about today is all about sort of this kind of um, flipping this, this, um, this, this kind of notion that especially around surveillance and, and technology um, and police technology, you need kind of a professionalized expertise of whether that's technologists or, or policymakers those are the people who are going to be kind of making the decisions instead our organizing tries to uplift that that um that you know the communities um that are most impacted by the surveillance and that's going to be you know your your black and brown communities migrants unhoused people queer and trans people sex workers those the the kind of communities that we organize with have the most expertise inc including on the kind of the most technical and and um uh complex aspects of surveillance and policing so yeah that's a lot of what we do phenomenal I think now we're going to kind of dive into some of the sort of highlights that you all have already previewed very briefly for us. Um, and if it's distracting, just know I'm happy to be monitoring the chat and I will also be trying to drop in links as we go through. So if others have um, questions or comments to offer, I should have said this at the top and I usually do, but I skipped it. Uh, we try to use the chat as a cue for questions as we go. And then when we get to kind of like 515-ish, we'll, we'll pause and allow people to engage and answer those questions. So if you have questions, audience members, as you're listening, by all means, drop them in the chat. And then we will, when we pause, take that as a cue uh, and take questions. Um, so diving in to the substance about your work and kind of your current projects. This semester, as I talked about, we've had a number of kind of conversations about harm, um, but I want to talk about community power and what this is looking like in terms of creating a policy infrastructure and also movement work uh, around fighting the surveillance state. So let's go in the reverse order. We'll start with Shakir this time. Um, can you tell us in particular some of the things you already mentioned were the work around predictive policing and also data-driven policing. What does that work look like? Um, how did that kind of community-led research process unfold and what are some of the policy interventions the research has unearthed? Yeah, so our kind of community-based research, I think, um, uh, I think of it sort of in the lens of collective study um, more than anything, and that's you know something that uh, I think is really important to movement work, but is is sort of um, especially kind of in the professionalized um, approach. A lot of this stuff falls through, you know. It's it's and and collective study. I think of it. I mean, I sort of trace it to 
you know, thinking about kind of um, prisoner organizing and and um, um, organizing inside as as sort of you know studying radical text, studying kind of people coming together to ask questions and and learn from one another. We do that, but we also a lot of the study that we're doing is study of of the state's operations and study of the state's documentation, study of public records and all of that. And so, um, as our fight, even so, going back to kind of the organizing against predictive policing, what that began as was was really just community members coming together, having heard about this stuff, having kind of seen hints and clues of it in police presentations and 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 kind of media announcements. And just starting by asking questions about it of like what is it that we want to know who what do we want to know about who's involved and who's promoting it and you know who, what the data sources are and and kind of some of the architecture and turning that kind of collective inquiry and collective kind of just you know asking questions into public records act requests and really turning public records act is the is our california's um version of the foil in new york or the, the federal foia um, really weaponizing the Public Records Act as a as a kind of tool of of study and organizing first in this form of it's a mechanism for people to come together to ask these questions to kind of first even just institute that relationship with the state of like we are asking for information we are asking we're making demands of the state not necessarily the kinds of demands that um, you know as as lawyers um, and both Conti and I have experience with these kind of you know large um, reform litigation against large police departments that that you know can end up oftentimes just feeding the sort of process by which the police department keeps securing more resources and and um political cover and all that like a, sort of a different approach of like the, de the the demands that we're making whether in public records litigation or just kind of getting the records and starting to research is not about the thing itself it's not about trying to have a court change the what's going on, but it's about kind of developing community expertise and developing community power and developing this kind of relationship of antagonism to it. So through that, we, um, we, we started learning about all these programs. We put out in 2018 a report called Before the Bullet Hits the Body, uh, Predictive Policing in Los Angeles that really both kind of dives into the like, it's, it's sort of like um, an archaeology of how predictive policing came about, both in like the programmatic aspects, but also what are like some of the intellectual kind of and 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 conceptual like roots of it looking at uh, looking at broken windows policing look looking at kind of everything i was talking about about the national security police state all of that um that report then kind of became you know it was both uh like just the process of people coming together around it kind of helped map out this fight that then came to involve for example students at UCLA who were opposing UCLA's role in developing research for this program and a couple of UCLA professors who were directly involved, involved, um, um, yeah, kind of really bringing together different aspects of the community. We later built on that uh, with a report that came out in 2021 called Automating Banishment, the Surveillance and Policing of Stolen Land, which really looks at the relationship of all this um, data-driven policing and, and, and uh, predictive policing uh, beyond kind of the narratives that we might be familiar with of of sort of um, uh, feedback loops or you know data dirty data in dirty data out the idea being okay like the data the data that goes into these programs is generated by police therefore it's reflects the um, discriminatory practices of police like that's one part of the story but really to dive into more nuance about how sort of the logics of uh, displacement gentrification kind of real estate development show up in how these programs are being implemented. Um, that a lot of that was also through public records that we got, like literally kind of mapping out the different hotspots and enforcement zones and, you know, connecting them to police killings, connecting them to um, uh, uh, these uh, kind of civil nuisance proceedings that are often part of uh, trying to gentrify or, or uh, introduce real estate development to a neighborhood. And so, again, that was another process that I think, you know, one thing it generated is I, th I think you shared the link is this, you know, 90 page report and and a cool website automatingbanishment.org but what it also generated is like dozens of community members from a variety of different kind of movement spaces and um uh uh you know organizations from tenant advocacy work fighting against the olympics whatever all of these people coming together and now having this kind of shared analysis and expertise that that uh they bring back to their own spaces and that has become this template for fighting back on this stuff Awesome. Thank you so much. So Conti, 
let's pivot to you and hear about some of your recent work. I know we previewed this report that you all released in March, um, if, which was an investigation of the kind of centralized agency data portal in New York, but also pulling from other jurisdictions around the country. So can you tell us a little bit about that investigation and how it relates to broader regimes of law enforcement surveillance and data sharing? And in particular, kind of what are the potential consequences of this kind of centralization of data sharing and also some of the interventions and policy recommendations critical in your report? Yes. And and I also just want to pick up by echoing on what Shakira said that having a shared analysis across many different sectors is such a valuable contribution. And it's what we are seeking to do with this work, where we're talking um, not only to, you know, the 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 civil tech or the gov tech folks in New York City about the very wonky, dorky, otherwise like I don't know, nerdy subject of digital public infrastructure, but we're also trying to bring in disability justice advocates, benefits advocates, defenders. Um, we're trying to also bring in the labor unions for the municipal workers that are seeing these union jobs not get refilled as a result either of the My City chatbot um, or because of um, the amount of outsourcing that's happening. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I just wanted to lift up the value of having a shared analysis of that goes and moves across multiple sectors and really grounds everyone in, um, in a conversation that we can all sort of find entry ramps onto to find common shared ground upon which we can sort of be critical and oppose these projects. So this... Uh, my city rep my city portal in New York City is, um, according to the mayor's office, an attempt to streamline access for New Yorkers who are seeking New York City services across different agencies. We are not contesting the fact that it is way too hard, that there's way too much keykeeping, that there's way too many duplicative forms people have to fill out in order to get very simple services in New York City. That is very true. However, the way that the uh, mayor's office is going about it and what he talked about on his campaign trail was building a comp stat for the city. Now, if you're not um, initially having a reaction that that um, causes you to lose your lunch over hearing comp stat coming back as a policy in New York City, I'll, I'll briefly explain. Comp stat was a terrible idea that was developed in the early 90s and used um, early through um, Giuliani's era to, as a political tool, to be able to um, try to create data that told a narrative about police interventions with public safety and why police interventions with public safety were working. But of course, because the police officers were the data collectors in this context, it caused um, that what it what it actually resulted in was just a really deep manipulation of those numbers for the purposes of political gains. So having that kind of policy reintroduced into New York City, not just reintroduced in, in the context of policing, but like also Comstat for education, Comstat for homeless services. It's an idea that we were um, immediately had our flags up about, and so we're naming. Um, those types of concerns. And on top of it, Adams has also said things like he wants to create a, uh, a predictive layer, a proactive layer, so that this is not just a dashboard for managers, but it's also one that's layering in the kind of automated systems that we've seen gone awry in other cities. Just to give you also some context, this is also the same administration that's now creating a very cumbersome process for city council members and the media to speak to other administrative agencies. So it's just yet another flavor of this like extreme micromanaging from the top that we're seeing in this administration. We're concerned that three things are happening in the My City um, portal. We're concerned about the predictive aspects and the data sharing that's happening behind the scenes. I'm gonna talk about each of these in a little bit more depth. We're concerned about um, the embedding of corporate technology and what what some some academics have called corporate lock-in or the ability of um, a single corporation to make everyone dependent on it, sort of like I am with my iPhone, um, and uh, corporate welfare. So the majority 
of city expenditures into my city has been outsourced to private contractors. And that's not counting the master service agreements with Microsoft or Salesforce that are probably also expanding C.2 corporate lock-in. Um, so going back to the first one, the data sharing agreement that is um, across seven different agencies. So this includes the Office of Technology and Innovation, ACS, the Administration of Child Services, the Department of Homeless Services, the Department of Education, and Human Resources Association, which is the benefits agency in New York City. They all signed a data sharing agreement regarding my city, which allows any legal process. So if the NYPD wants to issue one of its you know, administrative pretend subpoenas, it can go directly to the Office of Technology and get the program data from those agencies directly from the Office of Technology and Innovation, rather than having to go through those agencies. And so that is a problem for two reasons. One, it just is a one-stop shop, not for the New Yorkers trying to access the benefits, but it's really a one-stop shop for police. Two, even uh, putting aside the police's ability to go to one portal to find all of the city touch points for an individual. The other problem is that it invites what Adams indeed has said is that predictive layering. It invites the lead generation. The um, the uh, it, it tempts the process of putting some pattern recognition or algorithm on top of that data to do some automated fraud detection, automated benefits denials, et cetera. And so we're very concerned about that. And indeed, there's just been a bill introduced in the state Senate that would continue to facilitate and allow this kind of data sharing to happen and streamline um, cities above the population of 1 million, AKA New York, to do a one city project, AKA my city. It's all pretty see-through, but that's our concern first about the predictive issue. And then the other issues, the, the corporate embeddedness. So. In the last um, 10 years, especially ever since New York City IT services were all consolidated under one agency, we have seen the introduction. This happened under Bloomberg, hand in hand with Microsoft. It was a joint press announcement where they said that they were going to start this new thing called master service agreements. And that's just basically one big contract. And every time that the city has a new type of project, it wants to add into that master service agreement. The contract doesn't go through the typical type of procurement process that it normally would. Rather, it just sort of gets modified and updated. And while the number of those contracts has remained the same, the cost of those contracts has quadrupled in the past like eight years or so. And so we have some very serious concerns just about the complete lack of oversight because none of the procurement mechanisms, which already really corner and carve out any opportunity for public participation, engagement, or intervention, it's even uh, more opaque. And then our third concern, of course, and this is where it touches on, on sort of the, the labor issues, is that the contracts for the consultants that have been building the My City project have all included some language to the extent of, we didn't have the city staff to do this and therefore we needed to hire these consultants in order to do that. When in fact, those staff positions have existed in the past and they just were not refilled. And the mayor's justification for this has been twofold. One, tech workers don't wanna come in and the, the city of New York has a no remote work policy. Um, and then the other issue being that, well, we just don't have the tech talent. And of course, that's a problem that the mayor could solve, but nonetheless, it's the justification that they're using to outsource all of these not refill unionized positions. And also, of course, just by the nature of what they're building, it threatens to um, shrink the number of GovTech types of jobs. And then in addition to that, the just to give you some stats on the companies themselves, there's been $17 million of contracts issued for the My City portal. About half of that has gone to three companies, even though there was supposed to be a limit on how much each contract is. So we just see this um, combination of 
austerity politics, corporate welfare, and carceral consequences um, combining together in this My City portal, which is why we issued a report on it. Some things that we're hoping to see, um, we're hoping to see the process for master service agreements change as a result. We're hoping that there will be more oversight introduced. Um, we want to also um, involve and make more central to the development conversation, the benefits and disability justice community, so that they can have um, a stronger voice in developing and being a part of the visioning for what a portal will look like that will actually serve and create more streamlined access without the additional policing and without the additional vulnerabilities that giving police much easier access to all that information creates. And we're also hoping to sort of tie that into the conversation um, and the concerns about automating a lot of city uh, procedures and protecting municipal workers and their voices. Because we think that the, the democracy issues related to AI, it's not just about elections and deep fakes. It's also about protecting democratic processes and participation and public goods. What is happening in this context and in many other contexts is that the scoping, the visioning, the designing, the developing of public goods is becoming really cornered by police in the private sector. And we see that when the police and the private sector are collaborating on the development of these public goods for the purposes of their profits and control, we see the democratic voice really um, cornered out of those conversations and the public goods that we're seeing coming down the pipe, including digital IDs and digital wallets and these databases are no longer serving the public good as much as they're serving police and corporations. Thank you for that. Um, scary also, <laughs> odd to say thank you when your, your ending note is uh, about the police state and, and corporate control and consolidation, but I really appreciate that overview. We're gonna switch gears a little bit and, and have Trina explain to us the groundbreaking work that she led in the Missing in Chicago project. So um, I, I wanted to kind of step back and just understand a little bit more about this investigative series, um, which I know grows out of a bigger project of Beneath the Surface. So you you are welcome to talk at length about whichever of these kind of fits the bill for, for giving how much framing um, is appropriate. But uh, in particular, how did the series come about? Kind of what was the nature of your work in partnership with City Bureau? and um, how, how this kind of relates to this broader theme of sort of counter surveillance of the police or filling in the gaps about missing police data and all those kinds of things. Um, and how this sort of compounds the harm for impacted communities and in particular black women and girls. So Trina, take it away. Absolutely. So first I'd like to say that like the importance of this interdisciplinary perspective is so key. And I really wanna up uplift the things that y'all have already shared because that was a really big piece of our work too. I mean, like, I'm gonna really jump into the missing in Chicago piece, but like we, you know, we started missing in Chicago with police misconduct records that we were able to identify through machine learning, through parsing through, and, and, and the people who created the training data to train that algorithm were community members who were reading police misconduct data, labeling it as, as relevant or not relevant to you know the issue area that we were interested in um police misconduct related to missing persons was in the neglect category like instances where someone called police and they maybe didn't treat them fairly or disrespectful to them so like at the end of 2021 early 2022 i came to sarah conway and i was like hey you know we have these rec records related to police misconduct on missing persons cases. I've been foying for um, missing persons cases from Chicago police and it's really not adding up, right? In, a, in the third largest metropolitan city in the country, they're saying that they close nearly 100% of these cases and that um, they're labeled as non-criminal in nature. And, you know, it doesn't make sense for a mirage of reasons, but of course, as journalists, you know, what do we have but public records requests, interviews with families, interviews with law enforcement, engagements with stakeholders um, who care about the issue so that we could begin to see the gaps. And 
um, you know, when you look at the data, majority, 30% of the cases are for girls, black girls ages 10 to ages 10 to 20. And although the majority of cases are for black people, there is this really interesting spike in the cases around that, what I would describe as human trafficking age. And so we had a really big interest in that, but also about understanding um, what was happening here, what led to someone being missing, how was law enforcement handling the cases? And then, you know, how were families impacted by the issue, period? And so it's interesting when like law enforcement are talking about data-driven policing and, you know, we, we have to follow the data because they, they have used, you know, their very bad data as a means for, you know, being dismissive of missing persons cases in the year 2017, you know, they spoke to city council. They said, look, look at these juvenile cases between the year 2000 and 2017. 99.9% .9 of these juveniles are returned or located. Nobody asked, are they found dead or alive? The condition that these young people are returning in. People really didn't, you know, they were just like, well, these young people don't want to be found. Within our reporting, we learned that there were actually two cases within that time period where Chicago police had closed the case before the young person had been found and that young person was later found murdered. So I talked about the first case in the year 2002, Shavana Prather, you know, she went missing April 19th and was murdered shortly afterwards. On April 26th, Chicago police wrote in a report missing has been lo spoke with the complainant missing has been located victim offender no. Closed non-criminal. Three hours later, her body was found and a homicide case was open. Fast forward, year 2016, Desiree Robinson, missing November 29th. She, December, like maybe December 15th, December 14th, she tells her friend on Facebook, I came to this party and this man won't let me leave. That man began to traffic her. Few days after that, Chicago police wrote in a report, Missing has been located, spoke to the complainant, missing has been located, victim offender, no. Four days later on Christmas Eve, she was murdered. And her body was, you know, it's like her trafficker went to jail. The guy who was, um, who murdered her went to jail. But no one really knew that law enforcement ultimately stopped looking for her four days before her murder, which caused the question whether they were looking for her in the first place. Right. And so, you know, even bouncing off of the fact that, like, there are cases that are labeled as closed non-criminal saying that someone had been found, even though there had they hadn't been found. We were able to identify another discrepancy in the data, which is that, you know, you know, I talked about this nearly 100 percent closed non-criminal. There were about 10 cases that were labeled as homicides, instances where someone began as a missing persons case. And then their case was later class reclassified as a homicide. In the year 2018, the case of Daisy Hayes is an example of that. Um, but in the same year, 2018, there were two black uh, women, one girl, age 15, one woman, age 26, both last seen with the same guy, both who died by homicide, both who in their underlying records, you can you know it's a homicide that has occurred. Their cases were labeled as non-criminal. And so when we're engaging with, you know, when we're talking about data-driven policing and under using data that is collected by law enforcement to better understand what's happening here, you know, it's it's quite shocking that like some cases, you know, would be labeled as homicides, reclassified correctly as homicides, 10 in the case of the year 2020-21. And then we, Sarah Conway and I, identified 11 additional homicides that happened in the same time period, right? And it's, it's so, it's like, okay, when folks, when police are talking about data and using data to better understand what's happening in society, which data are they using and what is the purpose of said data? You know, um, there, there are, when we look at the crimes that later become associated with missing persons, we not only see homicide, we see kidnappings, we see sexual assault. And when talking to law enforcement, former law enforcement, 
you know, one woman, she said she really tried to advocate for there to be some kind of human trafficking screening that was at least introduced when people return home because, right, law enforcement say, majority of these people return home. There's not a, you know, there's no, no issue here. Um, but again, coming back to what condition are people returning home in and, and the due diligence of ensuring, you know, determining if a crime has happened to them or not. What we found is, you know, missing, missingness is a cycle that is deeply connected to violence prevention. And people are sometimes running away from home and running into violence and 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 we learned kind of the ways that policing is is enabling and cultivating these spaces for exploitation of people of already vulnerable populations and so i um you know what's you know the the piece has come out you can listen to it online you can read it online um you can see some of the multimedia videos that we've done with some family members of the missing just so that we could you know ensure that you know not only we talk about the worst moment of this these folks lives but also the moments that came before and the moments that came afterwards because there what we learned was there are a lot of things that connect these people across space and time a lot of opportunities for violence prevention to occur but um but a lack of movement on the part of law enforcement and then, um, you know, what we've seen in other cities where task forces for missing persons have occurred is the, is the importance of community of in, in the process, right? Because um, there were a lot of people who described having to take things into their own hands. But then there were a lot of people who talked about the ways that law enforcement, you know, we're talking about surveillance here, the ways that there must be more transparency in the steps that law enforcement are taking when they are responding to things because there are so many people who are filing police complaints who are discussing the negligence of law enforcement and then uh, many times officers are hiding behind these FOIA laws saying well it's an active case I can't tell you about it but when we see that it's the case has been suspended we see well this officer had an opportunity to to do a really important interview and just never did it Right. And so families are on one end asking for more and more questions, asking for opportunities to for transparency. And um, and, you know, I, I just genuinely believe that the project itself is a is it an argument for this kind of open surveillance. Right. Not only, you know, one questioning the, the ways that law enforcement are the, the, the tech the tech that law enforcement is using and steps that they're supposed to take in, you know, in taking action on cases, but then also um, the ways that community members must have access to information about not only their loved ones cases, not only the action that officers are taking, but the kinds of data that 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 is being collected, you know, passively by law enforcement when they're closing these cases to better understand the other kinds of issues that are connected to missing persons, you know, which really bring us back to that violence prevention piece, that saving lives piece. And law enforcement said, well, you know, the city really wants us to focus on homicides. You know, we found a lot of missing people who were ultimately murdered. And in some of those cases, you know, it is alleged that law enforcement could have saved their lives but because they did not take action soon enough, um, because they closed their cases prematurely, you know, they ultimately were murdered. Yes, such an um, incredible use of public records to build out that, that architecture to then do this deeper investigation, Trina. And, and also, you know, your ending point is so important for thinking about the broader conversation here that we've been trying to have all semester of what does safety look like and for whom, right? Um, how is surveillance in increasing people's safety or impeding people's safety? And, and I think you're, you really put a fine point on that by, by bringing us back to that violence prevention piece of things and thinking about whose lives could have been saved had there been attention to what was happening to them. And communities that are affected by this know <laughs> what's going on, right? And the police are closing these cases without any true investigation, it seems like in too many cases. Um, 
You know, it's 5.15ish, so we don't have a lot of questions in the chat, but I do want to give people another prompt uh, to ask your questions. So if people do have questions, we can pause, and if not, we can continue because I certainly have more questions. <laughs> um, but I just want to pause for a moment in case there's a, there's a question for the audience. And if not, we can continue, and we'll remind people to ask their questions as they come up. So I'm going to pause for a second. Okay, in the meantime, while people think and process, you all have given us so, so much rich information already, I figured it might be useful to talk about kind of an area of commonality in all of your work, which is building on the sort of public records piece and thinking about the tools each of you have been involved in building um, around giving people real time information about police misconduct. So, you know, you've each done this in sort of theme and variation. Um, and maybe we can again kind of switch up the order and start with uh, Trina. Um, oh, we're getting questions in the chat, but we'll let's take five minutes on this little piece of things because I think it's so great that you've all done related work on this and useful to see this in theme and variation about the Calvin versus City of Chicago uh, suit and what that resulted in terms of the Citizens Police Data Project. And then we can talk also about Capstat and uh, Watch the Watchers, the kind of variations that that Conti and Shakir have been involved in. Absolutely. Um, so early 2000s, a woman named Diane Bond was actually sexually assaulted by a group of officers. She filed a complaint and, and a lawsuit. Jamie Calvin, former executive director of the Invisible Institute, he intervened and, and asked that police misconduct records be made public information. You know, in the process of our lawsuit, it became clear, like, well, people became curious, right? How many people are filing complaints against law enforcement and what's happening when those complaints are being filed. The Calvin v. City of Chicago decision, you know, gave us access to disciplinary records of police misconduct across the state of Illinois, but the Invisible Institute um, at the time, now we've expanded into other cities, but at the time we created the Citizens Police Data Project, which really focused on Chicago. And what we initially found was that there are loads of police misconduct complaints over 90% of the time they were being unsustained and um and and again like right open the door for uh folks to dig a little bit deeper you know fast forward into the Charles Green who filed another FOIA lawsuit this time asking for underlying records underlying documents connected to police misconduct records because you know that top level data it's very flat you get one primary category for maybe a whole list of allegations of misconduct we were provided the underlying documents for the years 2011 to 2015 you know we had a team scrape the narrative text from there and that narrative text which was ultimately fed through judy our algorithm to do some some better groupings right of that those misconduct records not only looking at excessive use of force or operation of personnel violations, but looking at context where people were experiencing police misconduct, um, responses to sexual assault, responses to domestic violence, etc., cetera, um, as a means of better understanding, right? Not just this rigid police misconduct in the like um, tidy category sense, but like the nature of the of the misconduct and how we can better discuss it to talk about solutions. Phenomenal. Conti, do you want to tell us about your work on Capstat? Sure. Um, well, nearly 20 years ago already, somehow, I was a young attorney and one of my very first cases involved two cops. When I put their names into our very tiny law firms, um, you know, case management software, I realized that we had already sued these cops before. And then I took their names and I put their names into the PACER database for federal cases. And I realized that actually many people had already sued them before. And that was, I think, my fourth case as a young attorney. And that early experience really shaped the way that I investigated every other case that came after that. Um, fast forward a little bit to 2013, I was following the same practice every time that someone would come into, I was at a private law firm at the time, every time someone would come in and have a complaint about a group of officers, I would look up not only 
their case history with our law firm, but I would also look up their case history with everybody else who had sued them in the Southern or the Eastern districts in New York, which are the two districts that cover New York City. And just so often, it was really clear that there was um, a set of officers, usually you could even identify them by a squad. And there was one squad in particular that I really just zeroed in on. And over and over again, I think I had four or five cases with them personally. Our law firm had more. There was a whole bunch of, yeah, anti-crime unit was up there. This was actually Brooklyn North Narcotics. Um, the Daily News did a spread where they went through all of their lawsuits, went through how much all of it cost the city. And so I started to realize um, through that process that there was really something significant happening here. And as Trina said, as much as cops talk about how they are all about doing the data-driven thing, when it comes to actually using the data to find out what their own misconduct looks like, they're just like, oh, that's so hard. We can't do that. We can't collect that. We can't we can't, we can't. And so, yes, when we released our database of police misconduct in 2019, uh, we called it CapStat to uh, play off of the CompStat um, name because they were all about the computer statistics as being their methodology until it came to their own. And so when we produced a public version of this database in 2019, it was called CapStat. But I'll say that some of the lessons learned um, you know, at the time that I started to do a lot of this, I was really new to everything data. I took a data science course myself around 2015 in order to just be able to have conversations with the data scientists that were building the um, the police misconduct database. Um, I was not as privy to or thoughtful about what it meant to collect the moments of extreme trauma for people and to um, portray them in sort of like a, a simplified flatter, um, whether it was a social network analysis, we actually decided not to do like something like a heat map because we were thinking about some of those things. But since then we've um, done a lot more thinking, the community of people that has all been involved in thinking about collecting police misconduct data. And I'd actually wanna like shout out to Invisible Institute and Witnesses Report on obtaining, organizing, and opening police misconduct data, which was a really great, thoughtful um, series of conversations about just like the things that we have to think more carefully about when you're undertaking any of this kind of work, including sustainability. So the police misconduct database from Legal Aid was retired, um, but it was partially retired because it was a demonstration project proving that you could make public you could put you could make police disciplinary records public and the things that police unions were saying were going to happen that we were going to be putting price tags on cops heads and people were going to start hunting police and there was going to just be all this like predatory police hunting as a result none of that happened it was completely um verified as a valuable contribution to the public conversations about police abuse in new york city and as a result, along with and wouldn't have been possible without the protests of 2020, uh, um, following George Floyd, 50A, the law that had been making police misconduct information secret by law in New York was finally repealed. And really the retirement of the legal aid database followed the repeal of 50A because now that information is just much more accessible and doesn't require the incredible amount of effort. And I'll just say that the, the other thing that we really learned doing this project as two people who were full-time assigned to it and a whole load of interns that very generously helped us read and do all of the coding, it's a lot of work. And it really took um, a lot of effort to do and to, to maintain it in light of the changes made to the law was just not a reasonable long-term project. Thank you for that. Shakir and Watch the Watchers. Yeah, thanks. So, so watch the watchers. I mean, I guess before it was this website, it was sort of this name we had for what we called kind of a counter surveillance practice, basically like a cop watch practice where we would train kind of um, teams to, um, you know, cop watches folks know is, is, is sort of, you know, teams of, of community members going around on the street, documenting police practices, documenting arrests and, and patrols and all that. 
Watch the Watchers was sort of focused on um, deployment of police at uh, either permanent or non-permanent rallies, documenting how police are moving, including um, um, LAPD has what they what they call the shadow teams, which are um, kind of plainclothes cops that infiltrate uh, protests. That's their term, as well as kind of documenting the deployment of um, uh, technology, like you know, surveillance technologies and 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 like the physical architecture at protests. So. That's what that that that's what that name is. Um, so a couple years ago, basically the origins of this watch the watchers is it's I still don't know exactly how this happened. Uh, this journalist um, just kind of reached out to me um, saying that he had this public records request against LAPD where he's a photojournalist and he just asked for photos of all the the officers. like he, he like he he'd done some work on police accountability and stuff, but he like not a project like that. and he was just like, do you think this is worth suing about? And I said, yeah, I mean, probably. I mean, I think especially because the re the response of the, the LAPD to that request was that um, it would be too, not even like sort of um, concerns about danger to officers or anything like that, but they just claim like we can't access these records because we would need to have our technicians who do like crime scene photos go and like dig up photos of officers from some archive somewhere. So something that just like was implausible completely impossible in terms of just like the data so we said yeah let's sue especially because um you know police are always posting uh, photos of themselves and and kind of their as part of their propaganda operations lapd especially is sort of real kind of pioneer of, of pr and um uh, you know they're on social media and they're putting out videos and stuff all the time so when we sued we just included all of that saying hey look you're always posting these photos of the cops so just give us a set of all the photos it was a pretty quick and easy lawsuit where the city then produced photos of 9,000 something cops, um, like headshot images. Um, and then a few months later, that journalist he shared them online and, and then Stop Like Be Spying launched this website called Watch the Watchers that paired those photos with kind of roster information. And then later on, we added salary information. Um, I think what was significant about, you know, there's been a lot of other projects like this, including ones we were inspired by, but I think like the, the like, the like kind of enormous reaction that that watch the watchers generated in part was because like the website is very much like not kind of taking an approach of like sort of transparency or like here we're trying to make like kind of you know we're trying to yeah like it's it's not about sort of transparency and accountability in the way that kind of public records are usually used it's very it's framed in an antagonistic way i mean it's called watch the watchers the cops like with their headshots it looks like they're kind of you know it looks it looks bad. Um, um, and, you know, it's paired with the kind of salary data in this way. And it's extremely accessible. It's something you can easily pull up on your phone, type in a name, and it kind of, you know, has this kind of whole political framing. And so literally the day after it launched, the police union went on um, uh, the warpath about it, claiming that this like exposes kind of undercover officers and plainclothes officers and jeopardizes their operations. Um, they immediately started saying, like Conti was saying about this kind of, you know, claiming that like bounties are going to be put on officers' heads. They described, they like found this guy um, online who uh, had kind of made threats like that. It turns out as we dove into this, the same person had been trotted out by the police, like, or his threats like 25 years ago when LAPD first launched their website and put photos of cops. They cited the same person. Oh, he's making threats about bounties on officers' heads. So it's this kind of, you know, this has been going on forever. But um, so then, you know, that was, that's sort of the beginning of the saga. Um, the city then filed a lawsuit against us saying that all these records that they had released, they didn't actually mean to release them. And so we needed to give them all back um, and, and trying to get an order that like the sheriff could come seize them. The whole thing was like, you know, on First Amendment grounds, absurd. Um, but just, you know, designed to just waste our time and, and to create a spectacle of it. And also mainly like, you know, a bunch of these politicians, including our newly elected city attorney, you know, the, in, in LA, the, the police union is like one of the large, I think it's probably like one of the largest, um, concentrated kind of lobbying organizations in the city, major donor to a lot of the city council to the current city attorney. So it just really became this whole political thing of the city attorney, our city attorney here is elected, um, just showing the police that she'll, you know, do whatever they want and even like frivolously pursue this kind of lawsuit against against the press. Um, the city then, all these city officials then responded by also 
fear mongering about this and describing, oh my God, it was a security breach that released the photos and all these cops' lives are in danger and people are going to die and all the you know undercover operations can't happen anymore. Um, so they started saying all that stuff, which was just like a kind of incredible handout to all these cops then, who then a few months later, some 900 John and Jane Doe police officers sued the city of Los Angeles saying, well, look, all these city's officials are saying that, you know, is, are, privacy was breached and all this harm is happening. So we are owed millions of dollars in emotional damages because we're stressed and we can't sleep and, you know, it's causing us all this trauma. Um, so that case is still going on. And, and worse, the city of Los Angeles then um, sued us again, both Stop by Be Spying and the journalists for a second time now saying um, that we need to indemnify whatever damages are owed to those cops. Um, um, so we're fighting all that on the legal front. But I think, like I said, and in that way, I think the lawsuits and all of this has just forced a real political crisis of like really showing like showing who's who and where they stand and kind of the lengths they'll go to. Um, and also has forced this political conversation about like, you know, 900 cops here in L.A. That's like a tenth of the police force are claiming that they're like undercovers whose identities are secret. It's like I like that's that I think is sort of speaks, you know, forces this conversation publicly. What is, you know, they and then the fact that the, the, the police department is turning around and saying, yeah, that all of these photos should be secret. It just speaks to they 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 see themselves and want to be a secret police force. The city attorney is also now lobbying up in Sacramento to amend the Public Records Act to make it impossible to produce any records that identify any person. And they wrote that so broadly that that literally means that, like, you know, I mean, like any public or every kind of public record will identify like the author or the employee or, you know, whoever they're saying all of that kind of should be exempt. Um, but, yeah, I think another cool thing about this website is that it also like. Like, it's, it's just simple and not something we thought, like, you know, salary records of cops have always been very public and very accessible. And, you know, the whole conversation after the 2020 uprising, people have this concept of, like, the police budgets and how large they are and the share of the overall city budget that it takes up, and especially how much of that is salaries. But I think, like, being able to see it next to the face of a cop and to be able to see that, like, you know... This, this cop makes $200,000 and they made another 100,000 in overtime and another 60,000 in benefits. Like that contributes to the conversation about spending and it just it just personalizes it in a different way. Um, the other things we wanted to do, I'll be quick here, is just one is, um, and this is, goes to a lot of what Trina was saying of like, we wanna add, we wanna think about how to add disciplinary records while at the same time, there was like a proposal in this from the city controller's office, which is our kind of, um, internal watchdog, it's like sort of public advocate type person to do a similar kind of dashboard of police excessive force using like the police as self-reporting. And we were kind of critical of that and, and vocally opposed that saying, no, like that data is obviously just like police self kind of reporting on what they consider excessive force or not. That's not at all. We don't want that to be the kind of story of, of excessive force. At the same time, we want to put something out there and the disciplinary data is so in, in LA, it's sort of, or California is similar to 50A, it's it's like extremely hard to access that. So just trying to figure out how to do that in a way that we're like, not just kind of using their records, but also sometimes using their records, like their photos, that. And then also liability data, which I know in New York, y'all have published. Also being careful about that, of like not wanting that to contribute to some conversation about like, um, oh, you know, the police are, all this money is going to, being paid out that I know, in, you know, under the de Blasio administration in New York was like a big part of the, okay, we need to cut that spending. And like here, you know, we think police should be paying way more money in liability payments. We're not trying to say it should be less. We're saying it should arguably be more like victims of police misconduct need more money, but maybe like being able to tie it in the way that you were describing Conti to individual cops, that sort of is a way around this conversation. It's not about the overall liability of the city. It's sort of like about this cop is costing us not just three hundred thousand dollars in salaries, but also all this in in uh, liability payments. That's been very hard to just actually go through that data and all that. So at some point, I will. I would love to follow up with both you, Trina, and, and Conti to talk about how y'all did that. The thing with Stop and Be Spying is we're like so many people who do surveillance and technology stuff are like kind of into technology, and that's why they like do it. We like hate technology, and that's why we think cops shouldn't be using it either. So we're really bad at that kind of thing. <laughs> Definitely could use some uh, outside expertise. Incredible. 
love that you all will continue to connect and uh, and I'm sure it will be very fruitful. We do have a few questions in the chat, so I'm going to start in the order in which we receive them. The first one I think is really for Trina because you, you mentioned the use of machine learning and kind of processing the voluminous records you received. So Melanie, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Um, yes, um, since you guys are all talking about um, digital surveillance and then machine learning came up, I was wondering, is there a connection between the machine learning? Um, I've heard it before, but when it came up in this discussion, I decided I don't know enough about that term machine learning and seeing if it connects with all this uh, digital surveillance and all the things that you're talking about, which is blowing my mind <laughs> because I'm starting in movement work and I'm just like, oh my God, uh, we have to do so much more. And we're in this whole political chaos <laughs> that we've got to get a handle on all of this stuff. Go ahead, Trina. Thank you so much for your question. I'm gonna try to be quick. I know we're for time piece. So, oh my goodness. One, in the digital age, it is so important to me that we try to get our grasp on these like technological advances because our data is being used and leveraged on a regular basis. And we should be mindful of how it's being used. This is the like, the, the most, accessible way I can explain machine learning is like, you know how you scrolling on Twitter and you like a post and then all of a sudden you start seeing other posts that look like that post, you know, it's like you when you press like when you like that thing you're you're giving your maybe your algorithm some training data about what you like. Right. So then the computer is able to, you know, look at other kinds of content and see, oh, let's show this more. And I want to give folks the opportunity because I know their predictive policing came up. And so I want to make space for other folks. And so and so when we're talking about when I'm talking about machine learning in the context of my work, I am it is like, let's just say on the timeline is narratives of police misconduct, different contexts where that is happening. And the button that you press is maybe not a like, but a label. Like, oh, this is this kind of police misconduct. Oh, this is this kind of police misconduct. So that the algorithm can take a look at the other large, you know, body of text that talk about the police misconduct and can point us in that direction. To, to stop, you know, it's a lot of times people say it's like you're looking for a needle in a haystack. When you introduce machine learning to some narrative text, you then get like haystacks full of needles. So there might be some noise. You might get something on your timeline that you don't, that's not really relevant to what you're looking for, but you're more likely to have information that is related to what you're seeking in front of you. I hope that was a good explanation for you. It was. It really was. Phenomenal. Thank you so much. Our next question is from Michelle Fields. Michelle, would you like to unmute and ask your question? I think Michelle is still in the list. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask the question, which is, does the sharing of data come into conflict with data privacy laws? So, Conti, maybe you can lead us off with this, since this is really, I think, responsive to some of the system mapping work that you've done. Yes. Um, in short, long answer um, would also be yes with some explanation. I mean, data sharing will always implicate um, concerns about the restrictions of who and who under what context um, can access your information. And so in some contexts, so if you look through, um, I can share the, the data sharing agreement that's involved in the MyCity report because I've got it open. Um, so the you can read through the, the data sharing agreement here and you can see how there's a particular set of purposes for which data sharing is permissible. 
and there's a certain set of circumstances in which it's not. Those circumstances which it's supposed to be permissible for include streamlining access. There's nothing in the permissible list of circumstances that talks about policing or increased um, surveillance systems or increasing the ability of police to understand every touch point that someone has with different agencies in the city. And yet when you read through this agreement, you can see how that purpose is sort of being, um, uh, the, the purpose of the data sharing is being expanded into that purpose without it necessarily being a legitimate one. I hope that that's um, a clear enough and also short answer. Phenomenal. We've got one more kind of embedded question um, from Maya, who reports she is off screen eating spaghetti. So Maya, I'm going to ask your embedded question, which also I think will be a perfect way for us to end off. Um, and I know it's kind of rapid fire because we've got only a few minutes left. But the question was, what are some harm reduction things that folks can do on the lawmaking side to support the work of organizers? And um, and I just add a, a extra point on that, which is and to in particular support and recognize the leadership of directly invested people, which I know is central to the, the way that you all do your work. I can jump in to say that I think that there's some opportunities for a lot more public engagement and participation, not just in the process of, for example, procurement, but in engaging the public before there is even a request for proposal issued in defining and understanding the costs. And, you know, are we going to pay for more AI in schools to figure out the secret sauce for individualized learning or are we going to pay for more school lunches for more kids like there has to be some much more thoughtful public engagement and participation in the decision to prioritize a lot of tech in a lot of contexts and right now because so much tech is being outsourced and so many decisions are being made in the very opaque procurement processes the public notice and public engagement that um, should typically go into making administrative agency decisions, for example, is just being completely wholesale skipped. Shakira, Trina, any final thoughts? Um, yeah, I'll just say, I mean, I think I, yeah, I agree that, that um, like public engagement is kind of a sort of total disconnect between public engagement and how these things are developed is a problem. I think what we also see is like the development, like a lot of the solutions to that are these kind of um, like a like a like a public input process or a community advisory board or like a um, some kind of transparency ordinance that is actually not what anyone was asking for, including the people who are saying we need more public engagement. It's just a form of kind of cover and a sort of bureaucratization of it more than anything um, that is ultimately you know the same sort of failed approach that we've seen to police discipline, to police, um, uh, you know, to prison conditions, to all of these um, institutions of harms over the over the decades. Now we're just kind of, people just act like it's new because we're kind of applying it to technology and surveillance. So yeah, we do need some sort of more radical form of political engagement and kind of input on this. What that looks like is, 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 a, is, is more nuanced and hard to figure out. If I could unmute for just a second and clarify that question, if any of you have ideas about like structural things, um, you know, whether it's like charter changes, you know, just like the things we can do. <laughs> um, I mean, I think we need like all methods and trying to figure out how to support the work of organizers in ways that um, can create affordances. I, I agree with you that the like surveillance ordinances and stuff, they're not really working the way we want them to. Um, yeah. I know we're at time, but since we're in a room full of policy people, I, I I will say my two things that I think will be good. One is just, and these are not that ambitious, actually. It's just expanding the public records laws on all this stuff. Like everything we've just been talking about, about all these limitations, both um, on, on kind of, you know, like Trina was talking about open investigations, Conti was talking about disciplinary stuff. Like, I think just expanding that mechanism, not making it about like police reporting, but just increasing kind of public access to this stuff can have a huge effect. And then bans. I think, you know, instead of um, trying to kind of regulate the use of certain technologies, we need to treat them as sort of unacceptable, like we do with biological weapons and, and you know, chemical weapons. And I think that should be true for a lot of these basic things is that like, it should be considered totally unacceptable and taboo. And 
and and I think laws can play a role in 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 having that approach to it rather than an approach of normalizing. I will also just really quickly say anytime that you see the kinds of um, data sharing um, legislation coming past, just being in touch and grounded and informed by the communities that are actually needing benefits and relying on the social safety net systems and the education systems and, and all of the various services to find out what their vision for the perfect kind of portal might be. And also what the costs of adding extra dimensions of policing to that portal would be so that it's not just police and private sectors um, that are lobbying and forming the next generation of digital goods. With that, I think we are out of time. So just have to say a huge thanks to all three of you. Thank you so much for making time. I know you're incredibly busy and that this was a crazy week in particular for Trina. So thank you for sharing your voice with us. Uh, uh, you know, speak your mind even when your voice shakes, I think is the is the quote. So we definitely could hear you. <laughs> um, and we will be, you know, continuing to have other series for public engagement in the future. So if people were interested in this this semester, thank you so much. And again, the videos are going to be posted on our website, on the individual event pages, as well as on our YouTube channel. Um, I am going to quickly drop those links in the chat before we head out um, in response to one of the questions we got. And again, we'll share the links that have been threaded throughout the chat um, on the event page when we get the video posted, which takes a little bit of time just to make sure we edit the captions accordingly. Thank you all.